Good evening, everyone. I think you can see from the name on my screen, um, David Cross, the speaker, um, you can gather I'm not David, it's just that I'm Margaret Cross and my computer microphone's just stopped working. So, welcome to the third webinar from the IOP Hereford and Worcester Centre in what's going to be, sadly, a whole year of virtual webinars. It does mean we can listen to the computer from the comfort of our own homes, but is it the same as travelling to a lecture and meeting real people? Certainly, for the speakers, it's not the same talking to a computer as it is facing a live audience. I mean, I wonder who I'm talking to now. So please have sympathy for the speaker. Uh, first of all, the future programme. On the 16th of December, there'll be a talk hosted by Wolverhampton University, photographing the universe given by Dr Figuera. On the 14th of January, this centre, Hereford and Worcester, is hosting Professor Marcel McManus giving a talk, Net Zero by Life Cycle, How to Reduce Greenhouse Gases, which is actually complementing tonight's lecture. Sadly, our annual hunting hall lecture with Martin Ketcherer and his most dangerous experiments in physics cannot take place now. It really does need a live audience and live experiments, of course, to be effective. So it'll be postponed to the autumn, we hope. Then on the 25th of February, there's an annual joint Hereford and Worcestershire IET IOP IMEC -E lecture um, on the Internet of Things and the Land Speed Record given by Peter Carney. I think you'll all have heard about Bloodhound. Registration for all these lectures is by the events page of the IOP and the IET, and I intend to add the links uh, to the chat so you can copy it. Time now to introduce the speaker. And you'll deduce from being in the same house with the same surname that I'm actually related to David. In fact, I've known him for well over 50 years. He studied physics and electronic engineering at university, but made his career in the computer industry running several of his own companies. Um, this has given him the luxury of indulging in physics as an interest rather than as a job. And there's always some science books piled up at the side of his bed. His concern about climate change and global warming has led to the to introducing the topic into our research work, plug for the um, science in the park and um, um, next generation innovators, uh, outreach work for young people. And now this is a talk to make other concerned people realise that there is still some hope for us all. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce David Cross, who's at the minute. Thank you, dear. Oh, now then. Well, the microphone problems have scuppered my first joke of the evening because I was going to explain how I'd banished her to the other room so that I wouldn't be interrupted. Never mind. Um, you should also notice that. Uh, do I need to do that? I hope you can now see the uh, screen with the title on it. Um, one of the things that you notice after you've been married for 50 odd years is that um, life does get pretty much the same. So one of the reasons for giving this lecture is to maneuver my wife into a position where she has to say nice things about me in public. And that seems to have worked. So I'm winning already. Um, so I think I'll quit while I'm ahead. Should I? No, no maybe I'll carry on. All right. Here we go then. Uh, first thing I should note, uh, mention to you is that the subtitling system is a new one we're trialing. It's done by Microsoft. So it may produce an awful lot of garbage. Uh, on the other hand, if you've just been vaccinated and you've got one of Mr. Gates's new chips installed, uh, then it may very well make more sense than what I'm actually saying. We'll see. Way back in time, when we could still talk to people directly, uh, that is before the pandemic, I accepted an invitation to talk to the Malvern Festival of Ideas on the theme of physics for a better world. And this talk was the result of that. That was for a very general family audience, and it was quite light. So tonight, 
I'm going to dig a little deeper into some of the physics that underpins some of this work. Now, I'd ask you to be a bit lenient with me because some of the physics you'll hear about is being done by people who self-describe as chemists, but I won't hold that against them if you don't. After all, chemistry is just a blend of applied physics and domestic science. And uh, I even have friends who are geologists, so I'm pretty broad-minded about uh, interspecies cooperation. Let me be clear about my position from the start though. I'm certain that global warming is real and that it is primarily caused by humans burning fossil fuels. I got quite annoyed by a Royal Society talk last week because they perpetrated two howlers. First of all, we don't need to save the planet. The planet is going to go spinning on merrily on its way for the next few billion years, quite happily, thank you. It's our way of life that is under threat. Also, I thought they dug the issue when asked about the controversy over the data. There is no controversy. It's settled. Scientists have more genuine disagreement about gravity than they do about global warming. I do accept, though, that the jury is still out on whether Donald Trump is an alien green lizard in disguise. If you're in denial, I'm more than happy to debate the issue with you after the talk, just as long as you've got permission from your therapist. Now, some people think I'm a bit of a hypocrite in that I don't want to give up on any of my habits, such as amateur motor racing or flying to New Zealand to see my daughter. So I'm relying on science and technology to provide solutions which don't drastically curtail my lifestyle. Indeed, I support the many millions of people in the world who aspire to a lifestyle like ours, and we owe it to them to make that possible. Having said that, I recall as a youngster being deeply in awe of Concord and hoping that scientists would find a solution to the damage it caused to the ozone layer. As it turned out, it was the accountants who fixed that problem. And I don't want to see our current issues being solved by any more reversing of progress. And if you need to be convinced that the climate problem is serious, take a look at this. I did my own pioneering research and came to this conclusion. You can see that the problem is getting dramatically worse. What this graph shows is the number of pages in the official reports on climate change presented to government since 1979. If so many eminent people can find so much to say about it, it must be a problem, right? And actually, that is my first serious point. The situation is still getting worse. Despite all the shiny new green technology that we're seeing, atmospheric CO2 levels are still rising. We're driving towards a cliff and we still have our foot on the accelerator pedal, not the brake. These two graphs are from the UK Committee on Central Climate Change, which made a report to government in June of this year. The left hand one shows the UK's greenhouse gas emissions, which are falling despite the rising blue GDP line. The right hand one shows global levels of greenhouse gases and they're still increasing although perhaps a bit slower than they were. We could have an interesting discussion about the difference between these two pictures, but my talk tonight is going to be positive and lay out all sorts of ways in which we can make sufficient difference to hold back the catastrophe. But make no mistake, as the UN Secretary General said, our planet is broken. It's five years on from the historic Paris Agreement and the world is not on track to meet the pledges made by all 196 nations who signed it. At best, we'll overshoot the one and a half degree aspiration by at least half a degree or more. I know half a degree doesn't sound like much, but every tenth of a degree amplifies natural effects that speed up the climate changes. Those geologist friends of mine point to high CO2 periods in the Earth's history. But those happened at least 10 times slower than our man-made increases. We're not giving the natural world time to react. The pandemic shows us that even when most transport is halted, 
and a lot of economic activity stops, emissions keep on rising regardless. COVID may have helped us by highlighting just how precarious modern life is and shown us how failing to act soon means you have to clamp down much harder and for longer. We all need to ramp up our efforts now using every single means at our disposal. And I want to convince you that we have the ideas, the knowledge and the technology to do it. Let's look at the problems we face in a little more detail. This is the total flow of energy into our economy and the use we make of it. It's a busy chart, so I'll zoom in a bit to help. Here you can see we're talking about millions of tonnes of oil equivalent, and the first sector is natural gas, either imported or home produced. Well, home produced if you're Scottish, of course. Most of that goes into two parts. The smaller part goes to power stations and creates electricity. The bigger part goes down to domestic use and disappears up our chimneys after heating our homes. You can see that we haven't, we are now making very little use of coal. We managed to get rid of the dirtiest of the uh, uh, polluting sources of energy, but the green sources of electricity, uh, the wind, the solar and the um, nuclear, really don't add up to a great deal compared to the natural gas. I was surprised at the size of the bioenergy input. A lot of that, I think, is the Drax power station that's burning wood pellets. Anyway, all of that is going into electricity and most of that goes into domestic use, but quite a chunk going to industry. The big solid block is oil. This is imported oil. I think that is our North Sea oil that uh, we've still got. Uh, some of that goes out again, some of it goes into shipping. But the bulk of that goes to transport. So these are, let me just go back to all side. These are the two areas that we really have to work on, domestic heating and transport. They're the two mountains we have to climb and we have 10 to 20 years to do it. Now 10 to 20 years sounds like a long time, but remember my joke about the reports on climate change? The first one of them was produced 41 years ago. Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth film was made 14 years ago. So what are we going to do about it? Well, here's a list of ideas I put forward in March. It's not an exhaustive list, merely things that happen to have popped up on my personal radar recently. Two of them stem from IOP lectures we've done in the past. And they're all practical ideas that will definitely help. Some of them are oven ready and could be rolled out tomorrow. Some of them will take a while to implement, but would have very powerful and long lasting results. I've kept a watch on the scientific press for the last six months, specifically with this talk in mind. And this is what I found. As you can see, there are a lot of entries to do with hydrogen and a lot concerning CO2. Ammonia is one I'd missed previously, and there are several interesting potential solutions which I've characterized as left field ideas. Let's revise my original list and briefly run through the general topics, highlighting the new science as we go. They're not in any particular order, and many of them overlap, so I'll just work my way through them. Methane is the bad boy of the greenhouse gases, maybe 30 times worse than CO2, which paradoxically means it's better to burn it than let it escape. The huge reservoirs of methane stored in the Arctic are beginning to escape as the ice melts and we have to move fast to capture it. Engineers at the Skolkovo Institute of, Inst of Science and Technology in Moscow are working in conjunction with staff at Heriot Watt University to flush out methane by replacing it with CO2 rich flue gases. That's carbon capture and methane extraction combined. Now mining in the Arctic is frowned on by conservationists. 
But if we recover and burn the natural gas buried there, that will be far better than allowing it to escape into the atmosphere. And the prospect of recovering the gas from cow farts is much less promising. And currently the best plan seems to be feeding them seaweed to reduce their output. Currently, the standard method of converting methane into a more useful mixture of carbon dioxide and hydrogen, which is called synthesis gas, involves lots of external heat and therefore huge emissions. So a new lower temperature method developed at the Tokyo Institute of Technology is almost like a holy grail. It uses a strontium titanate catalyst loaded with rhodium nanoparticles and activated by the UV component of sunlight. The researchers, quote, elucidated the physical mechanisms by which the photo excited holes in electrons drove the uphill reaction at low temperatures, unquote. No, I don't know what that means either. No matter how much we reduce current emissions, there is so much CO2 in the air already that we have to find ways of extracting it. We can either make use, make stuff out of it or lock it away for a very long time. Trees are nature's biggest machines for converting airborne CO2 into wood. So the more we have of them, the better. The Trillion Trees campaign was launched in 2007. And so far, it's planted 13.6 billion trees, which unfortunately is just 1.3% of its goal. They recognize that even reaching their goal would not be a solution, but describe it as a 100 year stopgap. To rely on trees alone, we would need at least 7,500 square meters of forest to balance the emissions for each and every European which is 50% of the total land area of Europe. But there is still some remarkable progress. In one project in Ethiopia, 350 million trees were planted in just 12 hours. That's 35 for every Ethiopian citizen. Let's look at the UK's first proposed carbon capture and storage scheme at the Peterhead gas-fired power station. I'll play you a truncated version of their promo video from 2005. It explains the project more clearly than I can, and I'll, ex and I'll explain why it's an object lesson in more ways than you might imagine once it's finished. By combining existing proven technologies, it is now possible to generate electricity on an industrial scale from hydrogen capturing more than 90% of the carbon dioxide emissions. Peterhead in Scotland is the proposed site for a joint venture by BP and Scottish and Southern Energy to build the world's first hydrogen-fired power plant. It will position the United Kingdom as clear world leaders in this exciting new combination of technologies. Natural gas will be piped to the plant from North Sea gas fields through existing pipelines. The gas will then be cleaned to remove substances such as sulfur. It will enter a reformer where it will be combusted with steam at high pressures to form synthesis gas. This syngas will then go through a shift reaction and continues on to be split in carbon dioxide removal towers into its component gases, hydrogen and carbon dioxide. The captured carbon dioxide will be compressed dehydrated and transported via a pipeline to an existing terminal at St. Fergus. Then piped 240 kilometers offshore to the Miller platform and injected four kilometers under the seabed into the Miller oil field, a porous rock formation that has safely been holding oil and gas for over 15 million years. As the carbon dioxide enters the formation, it will enable as much as 60 million barrels of previously unrecoverable oil to be produced. This enhanced oil recovery process could extend the life of the oil field by up to 20 years. As the oil is forced out, the carbon dioxide remains behind, stored securely 
and permanently beneath a natural impervious seal. With 90% of the carbon dioxide captured and stored, the hydrogen is burned to generate 475 megawatts of clean electricity for the UK, from which water vapor is the main emission. This is enough to supply 750,000 homes, the equivalent of a third of all the homes in Scotland. This project will capture and store up to 1.8 million tons of carbon dioxide each year the equivalent of taking more than half a million cars off the road. This is a timely, cost-effective and substantial contribution towards meeting the United Kingdom's emissions reduction goal. Well, the government of the day didn't rush to back the deal. And in 2007, having already sunk 50 million pounds into the project, BP lost patience and pulled out. In 2011, the government finally agreed to stump up one billion pounds to develop carbon capture and storage. And in early 2015, a new slightly simpler scheme was finally launched. This time, the flue gas from the turbines would be passed through an amine separation facility and the carbon dioxide piped to Shell's defunct Golden Eye field for storage. The project was to be operational between 2020 and 2035, storing 1 million tonnes of gas each year, down from the 1.8 million tonnes that BP proposed. After spending £100 million, the government cancelled the scheme later the same year, 2015. Three years later, in 2018, the government offered £175,000 towards a new scheme, the ACORN project, which is aiming to store just one third of Shell's target, or one sixth of BP's, starting in 2024. The crucial financial investment decision for that is planned for next year. What do they say the road to hell is paved with? Although there is far too much CO2 in our atmosphere, it's still very dilute and difficult and expensive to remove from the atmosphere at large scale. There are, however, currently 15 direct air capture plants in operation around the world. And one oil major is building a 1 million tonne plant which should go live in a couple of years. In Italy, this Swiss company, Climeworks, is currently removing 150 tonnes a year and producing methane for industrial use. In Iceland, they're planning to lock the CO2 away in an underground rift system that can handle 70 gigatons. So that should keep them going for a good few years. This plant is under construction now and should be operational by next spring. Because they're using free geothermal energy, they can get the price down to just $25 a ton. That oil company I mentioned, They'll use their captured CO2 to produce more oil. In February last year, Professor David Beeling from Sheffield came to talk to us about his strategy to lock up carbon dioxide in soil minerals. By spreading ground up basalt rocks over fields, natural weathering combares, combines airborne gas with the rocks to produce solid carbonates which are retained in the soil almost permanently. The practice is good for farmers, whether intensive mechanized farms in the Western world or small third world ones, because it saves money. And by reducing the need for fertilizer, it improves water runoff and cuts the demand for one of the most polluting industries on the planet. But the best bit of all, is that the rocks are spoiled from the mining industry in the first place, so processing and transport are the only costs. The drawback is that the financial benefits, especially to poor peasant farmers, won't actually justify the investment to make the scheme work. In my world, that's what our overseas aid budget would be spent on. So if we don't lock CO2 away, can we recycle it into something useful? 
Well, carbon dioxide extracted from the Drax power station is being chemically transformed by what the company calls biological catalysts, similar to yeast, into protein for animal feed. This obviously involves microbes, so it probably counts as biology rather than physics, but I'm still all for it. It seems to me that every week somebody discovers or invents a new catalyst. This one is made from dispersed copper on a carbon powder support. It breaks down CO2 and water, producing it ethanol, which sounds to me like a better route to synthetic fuel than fermenting crops grown on good value arable land. Using nanoscale copper wires instead enables the production of ethylene, which is a feedstock for the plastics industry. And it's another way of displacing fossil fuel derivatives. So what's all the fuss about hydrogen for? And there is a lot of fuss. I got two more high profile announcements about hydrogen just this morning. Well, first and foremost, it's completely clean at the point of use, producing only dihydrogen oxide as a waste product. Second, as this plot shows, it packs more energy into less bulk than any other solution. Cars, trucks, and mainline trains are already in operation. And so far, there have been no Hindenburg style accidents. In point of fact, hydrogen is less explosive than petroleum vapor. And no one I know is currently proposing using painted canvas for fuel tanks. Last week, Hamburg Airport opened a new hydrogen refueling station for fuel cell equipped vehicles. There are now 87 such stations in Germany. The third reason for the excitement about hydrogen is that existing infrastructure can be modified to use it. It's about the only hope for decarbonizing the UK's domestic heating systems anytime soon. You may have seen reports that a Scottish housing estate will be testing hydrogen over the next four years. Fourth, it's an excellent way of balancing other power generation systems to varying demand. If too much electricity is being generated, use it to make hydrogen from water and store it. Then when demand exceeds supply, use the hydrogen to fuel conventional gas power plants. And finally, it's a major industrial feedstock that plays into lots of other technologies. Mind you, some of the potential uses, for instance, using fuel cell technology in private transport that don't stack up too well. One expert described vehicles powered by fuel cells as a crime against thermodynamics. This chart shows the losses incurred at each step of the chain between generating electricity to produce the hydrogen through to using the hydrogen to generate the electricity to drive the vehicle. Fully 70% of the incoming energy would be wasted. And even if that energy were free, it would still be hard to justify. But it's actually not that much different to a normal internal combustion engine burning petrol. Most of the energy in petrol goes into heating up the world rather than moving people around. Hydrogen is traditionally used to create ammonia in huge volumes to make fertilizer by the energy intensive Harbour Bosch process. And a low energy ammonia synthesis method is something of a holy grail for researchers. A team at Tokyo Tech under Professor Hideo Hisono have found a novel approach to creating catalysts consisting of lanthanum nitride crystals loaded with nickel nanoparticles. The nickel, capture, uh, nickel particles capture hydrogen atoms, which then react with the nitrogen in the lattice to generate ammonia. In the process, a nitrogen vacancy is created in the lattice, which then captures a new nitrogen atom from the gas cloud. Apart from greenish fertilizer production, the excitement about this technique is that ammonia is suitable as a carrier for hydrogen in bulk transport operations, like railways or shipping, possibly even aircraft. 
the ammonia can be split catalytically, re releasing hydrogen for clean combustion, or burn directly, with the resulting nitrogen oxides being recovered catalytically. We've already seen that the standard way of making hydrogen involves fossil fuel feedstocks and then more fossil fuels to provide the heat to drive the reaction. Professor Katsumata of Tokyo University of Science worked on the alternative method of splitting water using electrolysis. His team focused their attention on more efficient catalysts, which absorb light energy to drive the reaction. Recently, they've proposed a special form of iron oxide or rust as an even cheaper and more abundant alternative. I like the sound of this. Splitting water with electricity is okay if the electricity is cheap enough. Wind energy is essentially free uh, at night because nobody wants it then. So this project is a collaboration to generate green hydrogen as a feedstock for industry. Phase two funding was announced in February for the design study. Shell is also planning to build a colossal 10 gigawatt factory in Holland, which should be operational by 2040. Mind you, the news this morning is that some senior executives are leaving Shell because they think the company is dragging its feet on transitioning to be a clean energy provider. It just points up the high stakes that these guys are playing for. Alkaline water-based electrolyzers have been in use for many years, but the fundamental science, the, the fundamental atomic scale interactions have never been completely understood. The newest kind of electrolyzer utilizes a solid polymer electrolyte, which allows protons from the anode to migrate through to the cathode whilst insulating the electrodes from each other. The oxygen evolution reaction occurring at the anode is the limiting factor in cell output and longevity. And it's now been understood in detail by a team at MIT under Professor Yang Xiao Horn. This work involved years of collaboration and switching between atom by atom computer modeling of the catalytic process and precision experiments using a unique synchrotron X-ray facility at Argonne National Laboratory which allowed atomic scale probing of the material surface. The team found an intriguing and complex mix of reaction steps happening at and influenced by the disordered faces of the crystal catalyst, which they've now managed to model accurately. I've identified at least half a dozen other promising research projects building on this knowledge and aimed at improving the performance of these catalytic reactions and I suspect that efficiencies will improve dramatically in the next decade. Nuclear power station operators are keen to keep them running at high output levels, even when there is no demand. So using that excess output to produce hydrogen should make economic sense. Electrolysis units also benefit from being run constantly at steady state, rather than by intermittent sources like wind or solar. EDF recently completed a study based at the Haitian 2 power station and are pushing plans to site electrolysis units at Hinkley Point C, which is currently scheduled to go live in 2025 and at the proposed Sizewell C. Initially, they'll build a two megawatt system with two electrolyzers, one of the proton exchange membrane type and the other of the more conventional alkaline type to compare them at realistic scales. While we're talking about nuclear, the idea of building 16 small nuclear reactors in a factory and shipping them out to prefabricated sites around the country is supposed to shortcut the regulatory and planning hurdles that are responsible for making nuclear power so expensive. The first one is supposed to be operational by 2028, given a go-ahead decision by 2023. Late last year, the government provided 18 million pounds worth of funding, which runs out next year. And the consortium is pressing for a 200 million commitment to follow on. That's a lot of money to us, but small change in the nuclear industry. This is a very promising opportunity, 
but it's basically all about regulations and safety engineering. So we'll move on. Professor Severio Russo from Exeter came to talk to us last December. And amongst other fascinating stuff, he introduced us to the concept of making small quantities of graphene to concrete to make concrete much stronger and safer. Now, why does that matter? Well, if it's stronger, you can use less of it. And since cement production accounts for about 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions, we can potentially save 30% of that very simply. The concrete company has just signed up with an American stressed concrete manufacturer to bring this development to market. In complementary research, a group of Texan scientists at Rice University have pioneered a way of creating the graphene very cheaply from waste plastic. Incidentally, did you hear about the man who found two lumps on his battery? He got them tested and one came back positive. He's hoping it's not a terminal problem. Whatever advances we make in reducing industrial emissions, we still need to wean ourselves off fossil fuel transport. And that means a lot more battery powered vehicles. The Korean Institute of Technology is literally cooking up better anode materials by micro emulsifying silicon nanoparticles and carbon from corn starch powder. They promise faster charging rates, perhaps up to 80% capacity in as little as five minutes. Combined with more charge storage, that should eliminate the range anxiety issue, which is one of the things holding back the adoption of electric cars. The static batteries, where weight is not so much of an issue, cheaper and more abundant alternatives to scarce lithium make a lot of sense. What has held them back so far is the longevity of the electrodes, but detailed electron microscopy work at Georgia Institute of Technology and other places is suggesting ways of managing the dendritic growth that causes the damage. Back in March, I reported on research at Sheffield and St Andrews in attempts to get away from rare and expensive cobalt. So I was very pleasantly surprised when, in September, Tesla announced that it will be dropping cobalt entirely when it starts making its own EV batteries. So this particular development is about to go mainstream. Now, perhaps the most remarkable man in the battery industry is Professor John Bannister Goodenough, currently at Texas Univers sorry, University of Texas in Austin. I first heard of him when my niece's boyfriend told me about him and these fantastic glass batteries that he'd developed. It all sounded a bit new age and I was skeptical, but when I looked him up, my flabber was well and truly gasted. He's widely credited with making lithium ion batteries the commercial success they are today due to research he conducted whilst at Oxford. And last year, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry along with two colleagues at the tender age of 97. Back in 2017, Professor Goodenough's team at Austin developed a prototype solid state or, or glass battery delivering fast charging and high capacity whilst being completely non-combustible. Now 98, Professor Goodenough is still working with a leading South Korean manufacturer to find ways of combating the dendrite growth that limits the lifetime of the cells and getting them to market. Now I've mentioned dendrites a couple of times and so far I've ducked the issue of explaining them. Well, this morning, searching for inspiration, I came across a fantastic video which does a far better job than I could ever do. Unfortunately, for technical reasons, I can't easily show you the whole video. So I've just grabbed a few relevant screenshots to whet your appetite. This is what dendrites are. Metallic growths on the surface of the electrodes that have the tendency to continue growing whilst the cell is in operation. Eventually, they grow so far as to cause physical damage to the cell. And this is what causes the cells to catch fire. As the caption says, full understanding of the atomic scale interactions is essential to devise ways of managing these things. But electron microscopy is helping enormously 
and in the video you can actually watch dendrite growth happen. For the researchers, being able to measure the physical properties of the growths is key to working out countermeasures. I highly recommend you find this video and watch it, although it nearly made me go off on a rant about unnecessary background music. The website you need to search for is the Chemical and Engineering News. If you can't find it, leave me your email address in the feedback and I'll send you the link. This is also an appropriate point for me to remind you that if the subtitling system has completely garbled what I've been saying, I can make a transcript available of what I was supposed to have said. Uh, if you email me after the uh, talk, I can give you the link. So I'm not as negative about all this as I used to be. You could even say I'm charged up about it. And now for some slightly more outlandish ideas. Seriously, can you burn iron instead of fossil fuels? You can't just put an iron bar on the fire like a wooden log, but if it's finely powdered and blown into a furnace, iron is highly combustible. The only waste product you get is a huge pile of rust. Where this solution gets really clever is if you have a nearby source of green hydrogen, you can convert the rust back into iron powder again and recycle it. The whole process could be driven by captured solar energy. Or you could just capture that solar energy directly in some fancy new ceramic material called scandium substituted lambda tritanium pentoxide. When you want the heat energy back, you just squeeze it. The Japanese team responsible for this proposes using it to capture the vast quantity of low grade waste heat from nuclear power stations and then transporting it to urban community heating systems. Flow batteries are very large scale electric energy storage devices, which can stabilize the grid when wind and solar are fluctuating. They use huge tanks of electrolytes, which are usually based on rare metals. But a team at Graz University in Austria have discovered that vanillin, the flavor compound used in croissants, also works well. Since it's derived from wood pulp, it is significantly cheaper and at least it smells sweeter than ammonia. Finally, my favorite and the most audacious project I've come across. You don't need me to point out the issue here, but what's not immediately obvious from these photos is that the thickness of the ice is dramatically thinning as well as the surface coverage. So the volume that's being lost is huge. All that extra fresh water heads south and alters the ocean currents that govern, amongst other things, the Asian monsoon season. That ice also literally keeps a lid on huge volumes of methane that is now beginning to bubble up to the surface. As an aside, if you want to know more about the Arctic, I thoroughly recommend a book called Farewell to Ice by renowned professor of ocean physics, David w Peter Wadhams, I beg your pardon. A group at the University of Washington in Seattle has studied marine shipping contrails. Who knew that ships leave contrails? Well, they do. And adding salt water into the exhaust plumes could reduce solar radiation and slow down the ice melt. But in an unintended consequence, however, United Nations regulations aimed at reducing sulfur pollution have actually cleaned up ship exhausts, reducing the contrails and making the skies clearer and the climate problem slightly worse. Arizona is a long way from the Arctic, but at Arizona State University, they have played with the idea of seeding clouds in order to stimulate rainfall in the Colorado River Basin. Recently, they used that experience to develop the idea of 10 million windmill powered floating pumps that spray seawater onto the Arctic ice, where it freezes rapidly and replaces the summer losses. Another idea, 
one that has actually been field tested in Alaska, comes from a lecturer at Stanford University who started a non-profit organization to implement it. Leslie Field of ICE 9-11 Research wants to spread tiny glass beads over the existing ice to reflect back the sunlight and reduce the melting. Well, I've thrown a lot at you. Let's have a brief recap. I started out with eight ideas and I seem to have finished up with 16, which just shows you how fast the field is moving. All of them make sense to me and I hope to you too. And I'm sure that there are many more out there to be found. So the ingenuity of the human race, ably backed up by some awesome physicists, looks like it is equal to the task of digging society out of the mess that that ingenuity got us into in the first place. I'm sure that future generations will look back on us and marvel at the way we lurched from crisis to crisis, always grabbing the low hanging fruit and paying the price for our short sightedness afterwards. So what should we do as individuals to help ourselves and our descendants? Well, according to the BBC, all we need to do is drink beer and eat crisps. Walkers are planning to mix carbon dioxide captured from a brewery with potato peelings to produce fertilizer. Somehow, I don't think that's going to be sufficient. My problem with every little bit helps is that it only achieves a little bit globally, and we need much more than that to be effective. So I suggest a combination of making noise and supporting companies that are making the right moves. Ecosia is an alternative to Google that converts its advertising revenue into tree planting. I subscribe to the Italian company, sorry, the Swiss company Climeworks on behalf of my grandchildren to support their efforts in capturing CO2. I voluntarily paid to a shell scheme, so I pay a penny more per litre, so they will offset my emissions and some of theirs. Yes, by all means, cut down where you comfortably can. But the most important thing you can do is talk to everybody, especially people in power, and urge them to take some action right now. The bigger the action, the better, but the key thing is now. And finally, because I was a bit rude about chemists, thank you and good night. David, thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Uh, you've got a lot of very interesting ideas and I invite the audience now to uh, come forward with questions uh, which they should uh, submit uh, using the chat room and I will read them out to you. Thank you. Uh, that, will, that will test how well I've actually understood the things I've been talking about. I have uh, uh, one question from Donald Mackay, uh, but that hasn't come through. So I have a question of my own. Fine. Um, yes, uh, the, you have given a lot of different ex uh, examples of technologies that could be used to address the climate problem. Which ones do you think are the highest priority? If you've got a limited budget, which ones would you invest in most? Which would you invest in first? I got very excited about the idea of spreading rocks on, on farm fields, and particularly because that would help enormously in the third world. And as I said in the in the part in the piece, that's exactly what I think our overseas aid budget should be spent on. So instead of cutting it, we should be putting it to good use, helping ourselves by helping the climate but also helping the farmers we give the rocks to. It's one of the things that will work easily. It just needs pump priming to make it happen. And not huge investment at that level either. Some of the other things like uh, Shell's plans for building uh, huge uh, green hydrogen plants are driven by commercial necessity. So they probably don't need a lot of government support, just a little bit of, uh, shall we say, urging. Right, uh, but in things like trying to uh, concentrate on making uh, things like car um, 
fuel petrochemical exhaust and such like is that uh, which is the which is the most urgent problem do you think that needs to be addressed first i think because of the knock-on effects probably the most urgent is dealing with the methane in the arctic that's one of those things that if we leave it for another five years it will be so much worse it'll be much harder to capture it and it will because it's 30 times worse than carbon dioxide it will have much more of an effect on our climate the only well, good news about methane is that it decays much faster than co2 but it's not decaying anywhere near fast enough for us to be complacent about it and there as well as methane there are also um other gases and um, i believe which are in the seabed which are starting to uh effectively uh be become released with the rising temperatures. Can you comment uh, on that? Um, I can't in detail. That, that to my understanding, they are significantly less in volume, and so their overall effect is not that high. So I, I haven't done that research, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. I have a question from David Wilkinson. Have you heard about the recent plans to build um, using gas compression as a form of battery, as a form of energy storage? Yes, uh, there, there are, as I said, uh, these were just the things that sort of popped onto my radar and I dug a bit deeper into. There's all sorts of novel things. Um, old coal mines can be used for geothermal energy. Uh, we can drop heavy weights down lift shafts uh, to generate electricity uh, and then haul them up again when we've got wind power to spare. Um, compressing uh, liquid air in underground caverns works very well um, these are really alternatives to the traditional method of storing energy which is to pump water up a big hill and store it in a lake unfortunately in the united kingdom we haven't got too many big lakes we can use um, but way back probably early 80s um, i read a book which identified that the uh, what was it called um, the truth the hot air no I'll, I'll it's a book i'll i'll pass on in the uh, in the comments afterwards um but the guy there made the point that if we don't really have an energy problem we have an energy storage problem the energy is available to us but it's not available always at the times we want it and what we need to do is to find ways of capturing it easily and then storing it till we need it so things like the uh, lake dinorwick uh, hydro system are exactly the kind of infrastructure we need um, but as I say we don't have enough mountains and lakes to do that so liquid air pumped into an underground cavern or weights dropped down a mine shaft um, should work in tent as well and what about for example tidal powers tidal power is that something which is beneficial I which think we'll get high tides in the UK I think we'll probably get tidal power just after we get fusion. Which is it's, always it's, years away. Yeah, it's one of those things that's always 20 years down the line. Um, because the easy way to get tidal power is to build a dam across the Severn. That upsets an awful lot of people. Um, and trying to get energy out of wave power spread out all the way around the coast is quite difficult it's very hard to concentrate it uh, there are some undersea turbine plans but again you need a lot of them uh, it's actually cheaper just to build a giant wind turbine out in the bay uh, and that tends not to annoy as many people <laughs> yes that's true uh, i've come i had trouble finding the questions i've got some questions which have now come up um another one this is from malcolm davis you mentioned cow farts is this the wrong business end for gho emissions <laughs> any comments uh, no i don't i i think if i comment on that it can't it might lead me into yeah. trouble yeah um another question from c scott do you think that tran a transport revolution is needed to actually deal with the pollutants such as emitted by um, ships and uh, using bunker fuels? I think we are actually in the middle of that revolution. I think it's just started. Um, 
that's assuming that the plans for ammonia generation um, take off and that we do actually start to fuel shipping that way. Certainly in land transport, as I said uh, in the piece, we've already got hydrogen powered trains and trucks. We've got lots of battery powered vehicles. If the batteries on board those vehicles improve over the next five years, which I think they very well will, then we will begin to phase out uh, fossil fuel powered land transport quite quickly. Hmm. One of the comments made by Tanya Hutton is that all the solutions you've discussed are, are reactive. In other words, there's existing problems and you're trying to find solutions. Is there a role for physics and the IOP, for example, to lead regime change? Ooh, uh, frankly, I think that's a bit above my pay grade. Anybody else like to comment on that? <laughs> No, I, I take the point about being reactive, and there is a philosophical point here, uh, which I alluded to in the introduction. I don't want to see us drop back into a kind of hair shirt, new age mentality where we have to live off the land and uh, almost reverse progress. Um, the point about being human is that we develop the kind of infrastructure that we have. And what we are lacking at the moment is giving the benefits of that infrastructure to most of the people in the third world. So we should be pushing the developments that we've already got so far uh, much faster than we are. The problem that we have is that we can't go on using fossil fuels to drive that. We just need to replace the source of our energy. We don't need to stop using the energy we just need to find an alternative source of it. Does that mean that we eventually um, can, if, for example, use petroleum as a means of of um, having transportable energy, but having creating the petroleum rather than uh, digging it up from the ground? Uh, we, we will certainly get uh, into synthetic fuels at some point, and obviously we will carry on using petroleum for oh, 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years still uh, at reducing levels. Um, so it will still be a part of the mix in the same way that coal is still a part of the mix now, even if mm -hmm. it's just for heritage railways. I have another question. Well, a comment from Malcolm Davis, who uh, was the source of the question about cow farts. His comment is, uh, in fact, that the greenhouse gas is not actually from, uh, not emitted from the rear end, but in fact from the, the mouth. They, they burp. Yes. The gas yes. is yeah. he's, he's, absolutely, he's absolutely right, yes. Yes. Yeah, they, uh, uh, still, the, pho the photograph was for humor, for humorous purposes only. Right, thank you. Let's see if I have. Uh, Incidentally, one of one of the, um, uh, the point about seaweed is is quite genuine, uh, and there was also an alternative um, research project, which pointed out that uh, the southern hemisphere ruminants, kangaroos and wallabies, don't produce the same degree of methane, and it's all down to their gut microbiota. And there was a project, um, at least in consideration some years ago, about trying to identify the microbes in kangaroos and transfer them to domestic cows uh, to try and reduce the methane that way. Uh, apparently, seaweed is easier to administer. Right. I'm now looking to see if there's any other questions. Um, Here we are, sorry. Um, in many of the, uh, this is a question from Gordon Kopok. Um, pardon me if I've got the pronunciation wrong. In many of the ideas that are circulating around, I rarely see the full carbon cycle assessment published at the same time as the big idea, such as, for example, the hydrogen production methods. From your reading, have you seen much of this analysis? 
with well, the sugar that's the starting point. Funnily enough, uh, the next lecture in our series is by uh, Professor Marcel McManus from Bath, and she's going to be talking about life cycle effects and accounting for life cycle carbon usage uh, in a whole host of technologies and ranking um, all the alternative ways of getting to net zero by their total life cycle contribution. And I'm very much looking forward to that lecture. That's in uh, January, if I recall. Okay, and there was, um, just uh, picking up on the name, there was a Gordon Coppock who was a designer for McLaren at some point in the past. I'd be delighted if he was the man who asked the question. If he is, I'd like to uh, have a conversation with him. If he comments, um, I will let you know. I have another question now from Jonathan Gretsch. At the moment, the buzzword is net zero. In a few decades' time, this may change to net negative. Is it right to aim to reverse anthropogen anthropogenic uh, climate change, or should we just hold uh, CO2 levels at the 2050 level? I think we should aim to stabilise our climate in a way that is as beneficial to the vast majority of people on the planet. Now, if we can do that by simply getting to net zero, then fine and gandy. Personally, I don't believe we can. I think we'll have to go negative because we've already warmed the planet by at least one degree, uh, maybe a bit more, and it will get to close to two uh, before we get it under control. So I think rolling it back to about one degree above pre-industrial levels is probably the sort of target we should be aiming for. And my own personal view is that uh, when we see the changes, for example, such as the Greenland ice cap, which is showing signs as, uh, of progressive melting, which will not just will not just stop if temperatures no. freeze. I think uh, that again points to the need for some reversal rather than just uh, net zero. We, we, and we will not reverse it back to where it was. Um, those changes will take millennia, not just decades. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, we're stuck with um, what we've already done. Uh, all we can do is to really stop making it any worse. Yes, I agree. I'm now looking to see if there are any other questions. Um, very pleased to, if there are any other questions in the audience. Um, I have a comment from Gordon Coppock. I have made the electric cars, but not for McLaren. Sorry to disappoint. I do enjoy doing hill climbs at Prescott though. Electrically, of course. <laughs> so, Excellent. I like man, man after my own heart. Yes. So um, I think we've had quite a good set of questions. Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, I'd like to say thank you to the audience for not bowling me any Googlies that I can't answer. So, Well, I think, David, uh, I would like to say thank you to you again for a very interesting talk, bringing together a lot of strands. Um, and uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you.